Okay, so let's just quickly run through some basic ideas about the hydrological cycle. Like I said in the, the introductory video, I'm just going to give you the very basics here, and it's up to you to choose which case studies you want to follow up in a little bit more detail from the hydrological cycle, ecosystems, biogeochemical cycles. We're just looking at some examples now of Earth system cycles that relate to our, uh, our basic idea of, of systems as a way of looking at interactions, connections, and energy and material transfers uh, around our physical geography environment. So think about the hydrological cycle first of all. The hydrological cycle, well like it says on the, on the slide there, it's at the heart of lots of different things that are going on in physical geography and it's important that you understand it in terms of storage points, connections, fluxes of material and circulations of material and energy uh, around the system. It's also important for all of these cycles that you recognise how they connect together different parts of our, our programme and different parts of the physical geography environment that we've been talking about throughout the programme. These things, even though we sometimes talk about them as if they're in isolation, they don't stand in isolation. They're all connected to each other and they all uh, interact in a variety of different ways that you can be thinking about at this stage. So the hydrological cycle is important because it's a massive circulation of material around the planet. So there's huge volumes of water, as you'll see in, in some of these diagrams in your reading. There are huge volumes of water uh, circulating, and they're circulating around different parts of the Earth's system setup. So, for example, uh, we're not only talking about the, the watery part of the system, if you like. We're not just looking at rivers and oceans and lakes. We're talking about the geosphere. We're talking about the biosphere. There's water in, in plants and animals, and obviously we're talking about the atmosphere. There's a lot of um, water transfer or hydrological uh, transfers going on within the system, but working through the atmosphere as well as through the oceans, through the ground surface, and through, um, through the biosphere, through biosystems. So lots of different connections uh, involved in the hydrological cycle. So this brings us to think about lots of different processes going on in physical geography. And a lot of the other parts of physical geography that you've been thinking about during this module, they come back to and they connect with uh, the hydrological cycle. And this is another example of something which is global in scale. Some of you are doing your patchwork assessments on this. It's something which is global in scale. It's a global hydrological system, a global hydrological cycle. But it's relevant also at regional scales and at very local scales, where you can th see things going on. Uh, at a local scale which connect to this big global uh, system. Now in the basic reading you'll see figures such as this that illustrate where the world's water is. Uh, the vast majority of the water, 97% of the Earth's water, is in the oceans. Only 3% of it, uh, the world's water, is fresh water. And if you look closely at that 3%, well, two-thirds of that is in glaciers about a third in groundwater, and only a very small fraction elsewhere, for example, in surface water, which is just 0.3%. And if you look at that surface water, most of that is in lakes, with a little bit in swamps. And even though you might think, oh, the world's huge rivers like the Nile and the Amazon, they must be carrying huge volumes of water, uh, it's a very small percentage. Um, 2% of the 0.3% of the 3 it's a very small percentage of the total amount of water uh, on the planet. And here's another way of representing that. You'll see lots of different diagrams in your, in your reading that show you uh, this balance, just to demonstrate to you where the world's water is and where the world's fresh water is, the water which in many ways is most important uh, to us. You also need to just have a quick look at diagrams like this that illustrate the circulation of water through this cycle. We have Think in terms of systems again. We have storage points or storage boxes like the oceans, and we have fluxes or we have transfers from the output from the ocean into the atmosphere, transfer from the atmosphere to the land surface, transfer from the land surface into the subsurface or back to the oceans. There are inputs of water and outputs of water through each of these storage points uh, that we think about in the system. And we can look at those uh, in a little bit more detail. So I'm not going to talk about these diagrams in massive detail. You can, you can see them in the, uh, in the textbooks easily enough. Uh, but there are lots of diagrams out there such as this that try to put numbers onto the amounts of water, the relative sizes of the arrows on this diagram. And if you look closely at it in the, uh, in the set readings, for example, uh, look at diagrams like this and you'll see actual volumes of water being attached to different storage points and to different flux throughputs uh, through the system. 
What's interesting for us though is to maybe look a little bit more closely into the different parts of that cycle. So look a little bit more closely at what's going on between the ocean and the atmosphere, what's going on within the atmosphere, what's going on at the ground surface. And this uh, next slide kind of just uh, looks in a little bit more detail at the terrestrial part of the hydrological cycle. And you can see at the, at the center top of that diagram we can think of it as a, as a starting point with precipitation. And precipitation, and we're just talking here about precipitation onto the, onto the land, not onto the oceans. Uh, this is the terrestrial cycle. And you can see what happens to this precipitation. And some of it goes directly into, small amount will go directly uh, into water channels on the surface. Uh, but a lot of it comes through a different route, coming right down the middle of the picture there. Some of it is intercepted on, on leaves or, or, or tree trunks or vegetation. And from there it can be evaporated away. Some of it makes its way through the interception and goes into storage on the surface. Some of it then runs off from that surface storage by overland flow heading back towards channels and back eventually towards uh, rivers and into the sea. Other parts of that fraction that went through the surface through to surface storage will infiltrate into the subsurface and then we have a soil water store and we can start thinking about what's going on in the groundwater. So lots of arrows, lots of boxes. This is a really nice illustration of what we're talking about when we say uh, that physical geography can be approached by a systems uh, outlook or can be, can be seen through a systems approach. This is a really nice example of that. And if you imagine stepping back from this diagram now to see it in a broader context with the rest of the hydrological cycle, you'll think, well, okay, well, what is going on then in the groundwater system? What's going on in the, in, in the system with the ocean, with the atmosphere? And you can find, and I'm not imagining you'll be able to read very much of this, it's tiny, uh, but if you go and have a look in the literature, you'll find lots of examples of systems diagrams like that previous one or like this one that focus on just specific parts of the hydrological cycle. And the same is true when you come to look at other uh, the biogeochemical cycles, the carbon cycle and so on. You can pull it apart and look in detail at particular parts of the cycle or you can consider uh, the cycle as a whole. Here's a nice simple kind of diagram. Those are the kind of thing I might imagine you'd be able to uh, reproduce in a test of some kind. Uh, just giving you relative proportions of the amounts of water which are, which are going through different parts of the system here. Assuming that we give a value of 100 to precipitation on land. Well then what are the kinds of values in terms of fluxes between one area and another uh, that, that are going on in other parts uh, of the cycle there. Now that raises... Well, all sorts of different questions that you, you might have in your mind having just looked at those, those diagrams. But one really particular, uh, one particularly interesting one to think about is how long does this all take? So if you imagine some theoretical bit of water vapour coming off the ocean and condensing into a raindrop and precipitating out onto the land surface and getting eventually getting its way back into the sea, how long does that take? Well, the length of time it takes depends on the pathway that it follows. And the, the, system, the system's approach is full of different pathways between storage points. Well, going around the whole cycle from ocean through the atmosphere, back across the land or through the groundwater and back into the oceans, could take a very short time if we go through a quick system, precipitating out into a river channel, down through the river channel, back into the ocean. Typically, through the fluvial system, I think a global average value that I've read is about 10 days, a couple of weeks, on average, for water to make its way around the hydrological cycle if it's going that quick route. Imagine, on the other hand, evaporation from the ocean, condensation into, into the atmosphere, precipitation onto the ground surface as a snowflake in the middle of Antarctica and you settle on the ice sheet and you're stuck there for hundreds of thousands of years waiting slowly to move through the glacier before eventually you carve out in an iceberg and melt out back into the ocean. How long is that going to take? Well, it could take millions of years if you go through a really unfortunate slow pathway. But as an average value, uh, thinking about uh, recycling through the hydrological cycle through a glacial pathway, the average vapour snowflake glacier back to the ocean route is something like, remember it's two weeks for a raindrop, but it's something like 10,000 years on average if you, have a, if you go through a glacial route. So think as the planet goes from periods in its history when there are glaciers around through periods of history when there aren't any glaciers around and periods like now when there are some glaciers but not very many, that's going to make a big difference to what's going on in the hydrological cycle. Because one of the big storage points for water in the hydrological cycle, think back to those diagrams, the, the pyramid with how much water in it was in each different location, 
there's a lot of water in glaciers even now and when there was a Laurentide ice sheet and when the Antarctic ice sheet was bitter and was, was bigger than it is now and when there was a great big ice sheet over Scandinavia, Northern U Eurasia and the British Isles that ice sheet had lots of water locked up in it so during an ice age lots of water gets delayed and put into long-term storage uh, in ice sheets and it really slows down this turnover time. So as well as the stores and the fluxes, think about the processes that are going on and think about the rates at which those processes happen. I've just listed a few on, on this slide. But if you think about the theme that we, we, we introduced right at the beginning of this module, the idea of materials and energy, physical geography is all about energy impacting on materials. Well, that's what's happening in the hydrological cycle. Solar energy is impacting on water and it's driving all these different processes. And that's, all, that's what's going on in the hydrological cycle. It's all to do with energy impacting on materials. So when you're thinking about the hydrological cycle, the first thing that comes into your mind almost inevitably is going to be water moving around. Don't forget there's also energy moving around. The processes of condensation and um, evaporation involve not only movement of mass or material, they also involve transfer of energy. Latent heat, for example, is involved in melting and in freezing. Latent heat is involved in evaporation and condensation, being absorbed, required, cooling down the environment, taking energy in at certain points in the, in the, in, in the process, releasing energy, uh, heating up the environment at other points in the system. So water can absorb energy in some locations, it can move through the cycle and then release that energy at other locations. And that's a big part of what we've been talking about through, throughout this module, this whole idea that there's surplus energy at the, at the equators because of the excess of insulation at the equators relative to the low amount of insulation at the poles. And we keep saying that things like the atmospheric circulation and the hydrological cycle and ocean currents are all about redistributing this energy. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens by, for example, water absorbing energy, moving, and then releasing that energy elsewhere. So there's a geography to this, there's a transfer, there's a movement, not only of material, not only of mass, but also of energy through the hydrological cycle. Uh, so make sure you understand at least a little bit about how evaporation and condensation take up and release uh, energy and relate that back to what we talked about earlier in the module when we were talking about the Earth's uh, radiation balance or energy, uh, energy balance. So the hydrological cycle transfers energy around the globe. Uh, the greatest insulation occurs at the equator. So, well, I've just been through all that. You don't need me to uh, go through it in, in great detail. Relate what we're thinking about here back to what you've talked about previously in the atmosphere session in this module and in the session where we were talking about uh, radiation balance and energy coming into the Earth's surface and the recirculation or the redistribution of that energy uh, by a variety of surface processes. Now, one of the the visible manifestations of that, if you like, is clouds. And we, so I'm sitting here in the shed talking you through the, the, these boring old slides. Don't forget to get outside and actually have a look around you and see these things happening, see this happening in, in practice. A lot of you are doing um, the, these patchwork assessments where you're thinking about seeing in your day-to-day -day life examples of things that we're dealing with in the lectures. Clouds are a, 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 great, a great one for that. You can look at a cloud and you can infer the processes that are happening. You see it, the cloud is telling you a story about what's happening in the atmosphere. You can see the energy being uh, moving things around. You can see the moisture appearing and disappearing, evaporation, condensation, precipitation. You can see all that stuff happening around you. As you do so, relate it back to the theory that we're covering in these, in these lectures and that you're looking at in your reading. The whole point of physical geography isn't just to learn a boring old set of facts from a book. It's to be able to get that information, get that understanding in your head, and then apply it to things like the clouds that you see around you, the reason the weather is the way it is, the reason that hill is the shape it is. It's day, our day-to-day -day experience of, of landscape in the broadest sense, and I'm going to include clouds and the sky as part of my, my physical geography landscape. It's our ability to understand and appreciate that landscape, which is the whole point Point, uh, of doing, or one of the one of the big points of doing physical geography. So make sure you're applying this theory uh, back to those, those bigger ideas as well. Okay, so now might be a time just to pause the video. So don't forget, you can always pause me, fast forward me, rewind me. Uh, but maybe just pause for a second now, and then what we're going to do is move on.
uh, and I'm going to look at a, a, at a case study. I'm assuming you're pausing me now, and I'm assuming you're back now. So, okay, so we've talked very briefly about the hydrological cycle. I just want to give you a little example now of how the hydrological cycle connects to some of the other things that we're talking about in the, in the course. So we're going to start with the hydrological cycle. I'm going to say just very briefly something about stable isotopes in water, and I'm going to then talk about how that relates to our ability to reconstruct past climate. Understanding climate change, obviously a massive thing in physical geography, and one of the big techniques that we use for doing that is the use of stable isotopes and the reason that stable isotope um, analysis works in climate reconstruction is all because of the hydrological cycle and what's happening in the hydrological cycle. So let's have a, have a, have a very quick look at that. So you're familiar already, I'm sure, with graphs like this. Without going into any detail on this, it's what we call a sawtooth graph. This is a zigzag pattern, uh, which is reflecting, you'll have seen dozens of these, reflecting different aspects of climate change going back, well, in this case, going back uh, from the present at the right-hand side of the diagram back to 600,000 years ago at the left-hand side of the diagram. Ups and downs, pluses and minuses, and it represents climate. Now, often you'll see, as in the bottom right-hand corner of this diagram, the graphs aren't actually a direct representation of temperature or the, the rainfall or the, something directly uh, part of climate. They're representing some proxy indicator, something that we're looking at, which mirrors what the climate must have been doing. And in many cases, you'll see that little symbol that, that's sideways at the bottom of the graph there, the little delta symbol, and then the 18O. Uh, the delta oxygen 18. What that's telling you is that this is a measure not directly of climate but of a stable isotope ratio within something that is telling us about climate. In this case it, 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 it's in marine um, sediments. You can also get uh, oxygen 18 um, records from uh, ice cores drilled down through, through an ice sheet. But what we're picking out is variations over time in the ratio of different isotopes of oxygen either in the shells of creatures in the, in the, in the mud at the bottom of the, the sea or in, um, in, in, in the ice, in oxygen within the ice uh, retained in an ice sheet. So what's that all about? What are, we, what, are, what are we talking about there? Well, very briefly, don't need to know the details of this at this stage, but just very briefly, obviously you're aware that water is made up of hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Now these atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, they come in slightly different versions of, of themselves. So for example, just worrying about oxygen at the minute. Oxygen, even though it behaves chemically the same, there are different versions of oxygen that have different number of, numbers of neutrons in their nucleus. So they have different atomic weights. And those weights are, well, we call them oxygen 16, oxygen 17 and oxygen 18, based on that atomic weight. And in naturally occurring water, there's, there's a particular ratio of how many oxygen 18s you'd have and how many oxygen 16s you'd, you'd have. And that's our standard starting ratio, if you like. But if you then do things to your bucket of water, if you evaporate or if you condense or if you freeze your water, the heavier and lighter isotopes, so the oxygen 18s as opposed to the oxygen 16s, for example, they behave slightly differently. So if you freeze water gradually, the heavier isotopes, the oxygen 18s, will tend to get trapped in the frozen water in, in the ice, whereas the lighter isotopes, the 16s, can escape more easily. By contrast, if you evaporate from a bucket of water, the lighter isotopes, the oxygen 16s, they're more keen to evaporate, and the oxygen 18s, think of them as being a bit more sluggish, they tend to stay behind in the water. And that's what this diagram is trying to represent, that we have an ocean a bucket which contains a mixture of um, water molecules with a heavier isotope of oxygen in them uh, or water molecules with a lighter isotope of oxygen included in, in the molecule. And the lighter isotopes are going to be more likely to evaporate and go into the ocean uh, than the heavier isotopes. Now, there are two diagrams here. On the left-hand side, we have a representation of the world with no glaciers in it. So whatever evaporates up into the sky, it falls back down onto the land. And like we said earlier, in a relatively short period of time, it gets back into the oceans. So we don't generate any long-term change in the characteristics of the ocean because we're evaporating stuff. So you'd think you'd be fractionating, separating out the heavy and light isotopes. But it doesn't really happen because they rain back in again or they flow back in again through rivers pretty quickly. 
The right hand diagram, well that's a world with ice sheets in it. And if you have ice sheets in, well some of what goes up into evaporation and goes through the atmosphere and falls back onto the land doesn't come straight back into the ocean. And at this point we become interested to see that, well, it's mainly the lighter isotopes that are getting trapped in the, the ice sheets, because remember, more of the evaporation with the lighter isotopes, the heavier isotopes tended to stay behind like a lag deposit in the ocean. This diagram is a little bit inaccurate because it isn't entirely oxygen-16s in, in, in the ice sheet there, that, that's drawn badly. But there are more oxygen-16s than there are 18s compared with that ratio that we had in our, our starting liquid. So what that means is that this fractionation, this separation of some of the heavier isotopes from some of the lighter isotopes during the processes of evaporation, condensation, precipitation, freezing and so on, a variety of natural processes do this. But the upshot of all of that is that when you have ice sheets, they trap a lot of the lighter isotopes. And because of that, the ocean isotopic composition changes because it's losing some of its lighter isotopes and also the composition of the ice sheets varies through time because of the differences in isotopes that are going going into the ice sheets as well. So over the course of time because of climate change ice sheets coming, coming and going the isotopic balance between heavier and lighter isotopes of oxygen and, and also hydrogen although I didn't talk about them this balance of heavier and lighter isotopes this fractionation results in long-term changes in the isotopic chemistry of the oceans and that is picked up in the, the shells of sea creatures. So when tiny creatures like forearms drop down to the uh, bottom of the ocean, when they, they die, their shells fall to the bottom of the ocean, the shells have absorbed a record of the chemistry of the oceans, and that gets retained in the mud that builds up layer by layer at the bottom of the ocean. So we can later on drill down through the mud, sample the isotope values, and reconstruct these zigzag graphs of how climate has changed uh, through time, such as this one that you're, you're, you're seeing here. So again, you've got age in thousands of years before present, uh, and then we've got an oxygen eight, uh, 18 value up the side. You can see on the left-hand side there, there's a scale for oxygen 18, and that's being translated into whether there's more ice or less ice on, on land. We're inferring because of that uh, oxygen 18 uh, variation. Likewise, in ice cores, if you drill down through an ice sheet and pull out an ice core and sample layer by layer through the ice, you're picking up a record of what the, the chemistry of the oceans and therefore the atmosphere and therefore the snow falling onto the glacier, you're picking up the isotope record of what that snow was like, and as you go down through, through time, through the, the ice core to older and older ice, you pick up a record of, again, the, these variations, these sawtooth variations uh, through time. Uh, always remember to look at the, the scale on the bottom of these diagrams. Sometimes we're looking over millions of years, sometimes over thousands of years. So we'll always check very carefully exactly what it is uh, that you're looking at. And it, it, one, uh, one of these, the, the top one here is, is, is the hydrogen uh, isotopes and the bottom one is uh, the oxygen isotopes. So you need to look at these diagrams carefully if you do use them. But the general idea of isotopic fractionation being part of the hydrological cycle and that fractionation being picked up in the chemistry of the oceans and of the ice layers and therefore enabling us to reconstruct climate through the, from the past, that is a really important part of physical geography and it's a really important implication of the hydrological cycle. So I, I really wanted to stress that today as a nice case study uh, related to our hydrological cycle. So I've just put a few thoughts here for you to reflect on as we finish. Uh, they kind of speak for themselves. Hydrological cycle connects to loads of stuff. Think of it in terms of systems. That's what we're talking about in this whole section of the, the module. Think of stores, think of fluxes, think of processes. Remember back to what we were saying about uh, energy impacting materials, driving processes, making physical geography. Well, this is another example of that. The hydrological cycle is driven by, by the sun. It's driven by insulation. And because of that, it transports energy around the, the globe, trying to equalize this disparity of energy inputs uh, from solar, uh, solar inputs. Now you can infer things from the hydrological cycle, you can read it. We, in geography we often talk about reading landscape, like you read a book, there's evidence in the book, you read it, you get it out, there's evidence in the landscape, you can read it, there's evidence in ice cores, in ocean cores, there's evidence in the clouds. You can look at the cloud and you can say, ah oh, right, this is what's going on, because look at the shape of that cloud, look at the movement of that cloud, look at the, look at the fact that that cloud's raining and that one isn't, and look, that one's got ice crystals at the top, you can tell from the shape, that one's got water droplets throughout it, and you can read the clouds to infer what's going on in the atmosphere. You can read stable isotopes in ocean cores because of what's happening in the hydrological cycle. Everything's connected. This theory of, of, of 
atoms and molecules and fractionation relates to our big understanding of how water is moving around the world and how climate has changed over time. It's a really exciting aspect uh, of physical geography. Final point to leave you with on the hydrological cycle, it's going to change through time. Humans are impacting the natural environment, climate change is happening, the hydrological cycle is part of that. The hydrological cycle is going to impact climate and climate change. Climate and climate change are potentially going to impact the hydrological cycle. We, humans, I know this is human geography, not physical geography as much, but physical geography includes applied physical geography, which is physical geography in people. Well, big changes in the hydrological cycle would have massive potentially catastrophic impacts on human activity. So that's something else that you need to uh, keep in mind as you go and do a little bit of reading now, do a little bit of thinking, and, and back up what I've said here in terms of signposting, go and get some detail onto that, uh, thinking about the hydrological cycle.